As we have learned in the previous video, numerous dietary studies have been conducted on particular populations to determine how sugar influences the likelihood of dental caries. We'll be learning about the wipe home and turku sugar studies in today's video as they have significantly affected our comprehension of how sugar affects oral health. The wipe home study was a clinical trial conducted in Sweden for five years. It was described by Gustafsson et al. in 1954. It involved 436 mentally disabled adult patients who were housed at the wipe home hospital, hence the name of the study. This study aimed to determine whether the consumption of carbohydrates, mostly sugar, was directly proportional to the incidence of caries and if so, it also attempted to determine whether consuming refined sugar at meals in sticky or non-sticky form affected caries activity. Additionally, research was conducted on the effect the consumption of sticky sugar had between meals. The second aim was to determine if reduced carbohydrate consumption can decrease the incidence of dental caries. Let's now look at how the study was carried out. The institution's diet in general was nutritious with little sugar content and no option for snacks between meals. The inmates had four meals each day. Low level of dental cavities among them was also reported. To conduct the study, the population of 436 adults here were divided into one control group and six experimental study groups. We have already studied what control and experimental groups indicate in our epidemiology videos. The control group had 60 males who for two years received a diet practically free from refined sugar and high in fat. This resulted in the caries activities being completely suppressed in them. After two years, their diet was replaced by an ordinary diet where 110 grams of sugar per day was added to the meals. It led to a small yet significant rise in the caries rate within the control population. Now, talking about the six experimental groups, the groups were divided based on the kind of sugary food the group was subjected to. Sucrose group, bread group, chocolate group, caramel group, 8 toffee and 24 toffee group. The first group consisted of 57 males who received 300 grams of sucrose in solution form given at meal times in the first two years, but this was later reduced to 75 grams during the last two years. The inference was that no significant increase in caries was found among people in this lot. The next set of the population comprised 41 males and 42 females. They received sweet bread with 50 grams of sugar every day with their afternoon coffee for the first two years. At this stage, there was no apparent rise in the rate of caries. However, over the following two years, four slices of the same sweet bread were served with every meal, which significantly increased caries, particularly in males. The third batch consisted of 47 males who, like the control group, were given 300 grams of sucrose in solution at mealtimes for the first two years. For the following two years, this quantity was then decreased to 110 grams and 65 grams of milk chocolate was added between meals. It was noted that this chocolate group's caries rate had been low for the first two years but saw a drastic hike in the second half. 62 males made up the fourth group, which had a diet similar to the control groups for the first two years. They proceeded to get 22 caramels every day in two parts, between meals for the following year. As of the fourth year, this was changed to 22 caramels divided among four servings between meals. An isocaloric amount of fat with meals took the place of caramel in the fifth year. A significant increase in caries had been observed, which led to the removal of the caramel and a subsequent drop in the caries increment. The fifth experimental group with 40 meals followed a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet in the first year. They then received 8 toffees a day in the second year during breakfast and lunch which was changed to in-between meals, third year onwards. The last group consisted of 48 males who, after following the control diet for the first two years, received 24 toffees between meals during the third and fourth years, followed by withdrawal of these toffees in the fifth year. It was this group that showed the greatest increase in caries during the third and fourth years, followed by a sharp drop in the fifth year. Before continuing, let's quickly review the six experimental groups. These groupings include the 8 and 24 toffee, bread, chocolate, caramel and sucrose categories. Conclusions were drawn after studying these groups in depth. As was seen in most of the groups, an increase in carbohydrates 
mainly in the form of sugar, definitely increased caries activity. On the other hand, withdrawal of these sugars led to the increased caries activity to rapidly disappear. It was also noted that the risk of caries is the greatest when the sugar is consumed between meals rather than with meals or when it is consumed in a sticky form, as it may get retained on the surface of the teeth. More than the amount of sugar consumed, the frequency at which it is consumed decides the occurrence of caries. Clearance time of sugar refers to the duration it takes for sugar to be metabolized and eliminated from the body through various processes, such as digestion and insulin regulation. The longer the clearance time of sugar is, the greater the chances of caries. Also, a very important finding was noted here which stated that despite the avoidance of refined sugar and maximum restrictions on natural sugars and dietary carbohydrates, carious lesions continue to appear in some cases. Although this study assisted us in establishing a link between sugar consumption and dental caries, it has its disadvantages. Regarding age or initial caries status, there was no matching among patients. Second, although the nutrition guidelines were clearly stated, the mentally challenged patients researchers were working with did not always follow them. Additionally, there was no uniform pattern followed while changing everyone's diet, which might have caused certain groups to consume sugar for longer periods than other groups. Last but not least, it's unethical to change people's diets for experimentation while fully aware that the likelihood of developing the condition, in this case caries, is rising. The Turku Sugar Study is the next study we'll talk about. Turku, Finland served as the site of the two-year study. The study was carried out in 1975 by Shenin and Mackinnon. Given that xylitol is one of the sweet substances that is not metabolized by the microbes found in plaque, the study's goal was to examine its karyogenicity with sucrose and fructose. This study was carried out for two years with a study population of 125 young adults with an average age of 27.6 years. They were individually divided into three groups that only consumed fructose, sucrose or xylitol for their whole dietary intake. The sucrose group had 35 people, fructose group had 38 people and the xylitol group had 52 people. About 100 items including pastries, candies, chewing gums and even cough mixtures were made with each of these three sugars. Upon assessment after one year, it was noted that the groups which consumed products with sugar in the form of sucrose and fructose had equal karyogenicity, whereas those who consumed xylitol showed almost no caries. By the second year, it was noticed that caries had continued to increase in the sucrose group but remained unchanged in the fructose population. Xylitol, on the other hand, did not cause caries at all. Instead, it caused a reversal of certain early white spot lesions. Following the findings of the study, two important conclusions were drawn. First, sucrose is more karyogenic than fructose. And second, xylitol is non-karyogenic or even anti-karyogenic based on the reversal of initial caries lesions as noticed. In conclusion, the Weipholm and Turku sugar study have played a significant role in our understanding of the qualitative and quantitative effects of sugar on oral health. Both studies demonstrated a clear link between sugar consumption and an increased risk of dental caries and other oral health problems. By reducing our intake of sugary food and beverages, we can help to protect our teeth and maintain good oral health. For more such videos, Download our app and watch videos seamlessly and learn through visually engaging mind maps. We hope we made public health dentistry slightly better for you. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel and see you guys in the next one.